sing about our God this morning. Let's join together. Why do you turn into wine? Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. None like you. Our God is greater. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome in power. Our God. Yes, our God. Yeah. Let's focus on the power of our God. Into the darkness you shine. Yeah, out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. No one like you, God. None like you. Our God is greater. Sing it out. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome in power, our God. Yes, our God. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome in power, our God. Yes, our God. Yeah. Do you believe it? Do you believe he is awesome? Do you believe he is powerful? He is mighty? If you do, let's sing it out. If our God is for us, and if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? What could stand against? I'm singing out, our God is greater. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, yes, our God, yeah. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God. Yes, our God, oh, and if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? What could stand against? Yeah, give the Lord a praise offering. He is worthy of our praise. He's our God. He's faithful. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. You believe that? If so, let's sing it out together. Nothing can separate us from your love, oh God. We believe that with all our hearts. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being in this place. 
sending your Holy Spirit. Here we go. Nothing can separate, even if I ran away, cause your love never fails, oh no. I know I still make mistakes, but you have the mercies for me every day, cause your love never fails, oh it never does. You say the same through the ages Cause your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me your love never fails. The wind is strong and the water's deep, but I'm not alone here in these open seas. Cause your love never fails. Oh no, never fails, Lord. The chasm is far too wide I never thought I'd reach the other side Cause your love never fails, oh no You stay the same through the ages Cause your love never changes There may be pain in the night the joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid No, because I know that you love me Your love never fails believe that you make all things work together for my good we believe it let's sing it out you make all things work together for my good you make all things work together for my good one more time you make you make all things work together for my good yes you do you make all things work together for my good you stay the same through the ages cause your love never changes there may be pain in the night but joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid, no Because I know that you love me Your love never fails Yes, your love never fails. Give the Lord a praise offering. As we continue in worship, let's sing about the goodness of God. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand. For 
the moment that I wake up Until I lay in my head Of I will see Of the goodness of God Let's sing all my life And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Oh, I love your voice Speak to us, Lord You have led me through the fire in darkest night you are close like no other thank you for being close i've known you as a father i've known you as a friend and i will have lived in the goodness of god let's sing it out all my life and all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so, and so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Oh, His goodness is running after us Your goodness is running after, it's running after me your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Let's sing that again. Your goodness, your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Yeah. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life. All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able oh, I will sing of the goodness of God oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, show us your goodness every day. Forgive us, O Lord, when we don't look at that. When we look at our, our problems, our issues, instead of looking to the one who can solve our issues. Thank you, Lord, for coming into this place. Let your spirit here, Father. We, we believe your spirit is here with us. Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts. Lord, as we connect with you, connect with one another, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Uh, good morning and welcome to Lake Point Church. Uh, my name is Trevor Brandon, and this is my wife, Jameson. Uh, we'll be the host today for uh, today's service. Um, we invite everyone to connect with our church. So as you arrive this morning, you should have received a fan, uh, pamphlet, a bulletin, a bulletin. In that bulletin on the cover, there is a QR code. If you'd like to scan that QR code, it will send you to where you need to go or connect to our church. If you are watching online, you can go to lakepointonline.com forward slash connect, and it will send you where you need to go to connect with our church. Um, my lovely wife, Jameson, is going to... Uh, share the announcements of what's going on around the church.
stand and greet those around you. Thank you for being here. All right. How y'all doing? You guys doing okay? Hey, man, what, how, what about the band? Let's give it up for the band. One of our elders, Mark Germany, told me a few weeks ago, you know, Frank, I'm going to do the best Mark in Germany impression. You know, Frank, he kind of has this rocky kind of voice, you know, and he says, you know, I used to play drums back in the day. I was like, you should never have told me that. <laughs> so great job, Mark. And thank you, Todd, for uh, filling in on bass. And uh, Lord, you know, we're, 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 Lord sends us, you know, uh, people and stuff. And thank you, uh, Jameson and River. Great job as our, as our hostess today. <laughs> Awesome. So uh, we're just, you know, we're making it. The Lord's good. The Lord's blessed us. And, um, you know, sometimes we often go look at greener pastures with every area of our life. And, um, you know, look at what you, what you have, you know, right in front of you. And God's bless you. And just use what you have. And that's what we're doing. And we are so excited uh, for that. Hey, um, we come into a moment of our service where we get to give um, tithes and offering. Before I do that, I want to let you know that um, one of the missions that we do here at Lake Point Church is that we take care of uh, kids over the weekend. And um, it's called, it's a program called Backpack Buddies. A lot of um, churches do that. It's a big uh, organization in our, in our community. And so Backpack Buddies... Um, we actually take care of all of the students that are here at Red Top Middle School. And every year, that number changes a little bit. And what Backpack Buddies is basically, it, takes, it, it provides a meal or meals over the weekend uh, when, uh, for certain kids that um, you know, qualify for that. And we, um, we give and we have people in our church that, that uh, sack those up and, and, and give them out and bring them here and, and everything. So, but we have 25 students here at Red Top Middle School this year that we want to take care of. I think this is our ninth year of doing this. So we've been taking care of about between 20 to 30 students every year over the past nine years. And that's, that's a lot, a, a lot of kids. And so um, this year is 25. And what that means is if you want to do this, now, this is above and beyond your, I mean, this is an offering. This is above and beyond your, your regular ties, your regular 10% and that kind of stuff. So, but we, um, we set it up for you really easily. You can, um, you can just pay $20 a month uh, during the school year. I think it's uh, eight months and, um, and set it up and it's, it's good to go. We start in September. And the um, a way to do that, you can actually do that online. Instead of choosing uh, tithes and offering, you can scroll down the option to Backpack Buddies. If you want to set up a $20 um, a month recurring gift for Backpack Buddies, you can do that. You can go to our website, lakefornonline.com, go to Give. You can do our church app. And uh, you can actually give also through that connect thing that we were talking about, Jameson and River were talking about. So um, y- y- lots of ways you can set that up. But just want you to pray about that, uh, about something that you can do. And then another thing I'm excited about is um, the big give. So the big give starts in September. So it doesn't start this next week, but the following week. And we are partnering with Red Top Middle School to, uh, to highlight a certain nonprofit organization or an event in our community that sort of gives back. And so September, we are partnering with the Good Neighbor Homeless Shelter, and we are providing oral hygiene stuff for that. So uh, toothbrush, toothpaste, you know, dental floss, that kind of stuff. And so we're asking not only our church, but the school is asking parents, teachers, students, just to bring those and donate them. Hopefully, you know, we want new stuff, not used toothbrushes, you know, that kind of, that'd be great, right? You never know, right? And so, but you're going to see a barrel out, uh, out in the lobby here in a couple of weeks that says Big Give, and it'll, it'll show you what this month's um, Big Give project is, and then we'll just roll that barrel down uh, on Sunday uh, mornings after church, and then the school will use that, and so we're really excited about that, but that starts in September, and uh, so Backpack Buddies, Big Give, those are great opportunities for you to like, hey, I want to give specifically to this, but then our ties, man, that's... That is our, I mean, uh, that's what the Lord asks us to do. You know, in his word, it's throughout his word. And, and I'll let you know, in September, you don't want to miss this. 
I'm really excited about that. We're actually spending an entire month. I'm just going to set you up for this. We're spending a month on finances, on giving, what the Bible says about it, all of that stuff. Why? Because number one, it's in the Bible. And uh, number two, I mean, I'm, I'm supposed to preach everything that's in this Bible, right? And, uh, but not only are, uh, are we going to talk about it on Sunday mornings, there's some small group material. There's some uh, material for, for your family. You could do family devotionals uh, with that. And other resources that we're going to uh, be given to you as early as next week. And so that'll start in September, our, um, our giving um, series, all the month of September. But right now... We're going to ask the Lord to bless our tithes. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the awesome opportunity to sing worship and to play and, and just to connect with you, Father. I pray, Lord, that you bless your word. Let it be something that moves me out of the way and your spirit moves. Lord, if I need to go in a different direction, spirit, you need to stop me and move in that direction. Lord, we heed to you. We heed to your spirit to how you want to do things, Lord. We want to be led by your spirit. We want to be filled by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, we are in week three of this series called Broken People, and there's a lot of broken people in this world. You may have been in the place where you have been broken. I've been in a place where I've been broken. There could be even people broken here right now, whatever you're going through, or listening live or listening later. You could be in a position of, of, of brokenness. And so it could be because of maybe a big mistake. You're living with regret. Or it could be because of um, maybe what others have, have talked about, you know, said about you or are done, done to you. And we're actually going to talk about that today. Or it could be because of maybe bad circumstances that are just beyond your control, but it just breaks you down and it just, and it just makes you broken. This room is full of broken people. The Bible is full of broken people, but the Bible, God shows us that he loves broken people. Why? Because broken people have a need for God. Think about it. When you have been in the place where you felt you have been broken, what's the first thing you crawl car out for, except for maybe your mama? You know, if she's here on the planet, huh? but you, uh, you cry out to the Lord. Most people do, especially believers. You cry out to the Lord. We have a need for God. And even people who, who don't really know God and, and don't really know how to access him, they just, they just fall on their knees and it just, it's in our nature. And they cry out to God and they plead to God, Lord, help me. If you're there, if you exist, they have a need for God. So God loves broken people. Also, broken people help other broken people. Broken people are much more well-equipped to help people who are in a broken, in a, a season of brokenness that is similar to another person who can help them. So broken people help broken people. And then broken people are a trophy of God's grace, of God's grace. He uses stories of brokenness and how he walks through that and redeems that, and then you become a trophy. Your life becomes a trophy of his grace, and others see that. And that is exciting. So if you're broken, bottom line is you can be used by God. You could still have God's plan in your life. God is not done with you, even though you feel like, oh, I'm, not, I'm just useless. Well, that is not true. Week one, we talked about broken strength, how, how God can even use us when deliberate sin is allowed to linger, and then we confess that sin, like Samson did. Samson's life was filled with pride, and, and then it led to disobedience, and then it went to a third level of self-reliance. Man, when sin enters our life, deliberate sin is what I'm talking about, and that pride, and then we're like, okay, then we have disobedience, we're not following God, God's, God's rules, and and his plans for our life, and then it goes into self-reliance. We think, hey, I can, I can handle this. Well, then we are broken because of that deliberate sin in our life. And God said, God can still use you like he used Samson. And remember, Samson cried out, remember me, remember me, exclamation point. Same thing the thief on the cross said. So it's a simple phrase, simple Two words, remember me, God, and that starts you back. Last week, we talked about broken dreams. We talked about Ruth. Great story of Ruth. It's actually a love story, but really, Ruth had a life of brokenness because she married a, a, a guy, and, and uh, he died, and then her and her mother-in-law ended up um, moving back to, to uh, Bethlehem, 
And Ruth was, was not even an Israelite, so she had a new country, new culture, new language. Husband died. I mean, broken dreams. And she finds herself uh, just going in, in a field and just picking up grain, the leftover grain that, that those who were working the field missed. And so she finds herself there. But God used her story to help uh, us, because what Ruth shows us is this, e- even in the middle of her broken dreams, she was considerate of others. She was considerate of others. She was humble, and then she was obedient to the Lord by not allowing sin to come in into that vulnerable place. Because you and I both know when we are broken and sin comes in, we're very vulnerable to sin when we're in a state of brokenness. And so Ruth did not allow that. And, and actually Boaz did not allow that as well. And I'd encourage you to go, go back and listen to that message. But Ruth shows us that God can use people who have broken dreams. But in the middle of your broken dreams, don't make it about yourself. Be considerate others. Be humble. And be obedient to the Lord. Today's message, when we look at how people who have been broken by the hurtful actions or words of others can be, be made useful to God. Have you ever been, been broken by the actions or words of others? It could be, it could be very hurtful what others could say about you or, or do to you, especially, especially when those people are close to you. Now, the guy who, you know, shows you a certain hand sign in traffic and you don't know that guy, I mean, you, you're like, mm, then it's gone, right? You don't know that guy. You probably won't see that person ever again, right? But when it's someone who's close, that's when it really, really hurts. When we are covered with these hurtful words or actions, we start to question our usefulness to the Lord. We can even start believing in some of the things that they are saying, even though they are not true. Or think we even deserve these sort of hurtful actions. We, uh, it could even make us want to get even. That's something that sometimes I want to do, <laughs> get even. But that's not God's plan. You know, broken hearts, which is the title of my sermon today, broken hearts, it can come in many different forms in our, in our culture. It could come from From a divorce, it can come from false accusation, a wayward child, an angry boss, or even a close friend. And our attention today will be on David. Now, David is known as as the greatest king Israel ever had. And yet, he had a broken heart because of the way he was unjustly treated by King Saul. David's response to his brokenness is a great resource for us today. When we follow his examples, we put ourselves in a better position to be used by God. And there are sort of four responses that show David's character that we will look at today. Just four of them. Now, I'm going to be in a a wide variety of scripture today. Most of the day, I'm going to be in today's message, I'm going to be in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. So if you want to Take your copy of God's Word. Uh, we're going to be in 1 Samuel. Uh, uh, we're, the scripture will be on the screen as well. So we'll be in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 18. Um, you have Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 1 2 Samuel. So we're just kind of, we're on a journey, right? We, talk, we went through Joshua, talked about Samson and Judges, talked a little bit about Ruth. Now we're talking about David. Now, Samuel, the reason why it's called Samuel is because Samuel, um, Samuel 1 and 2, he was the last judge of Israel before the king of Saul came on board, and he was the last prophet of, um, uh, of, of Israel, and so, um, in, you know, in that period. So, we are at uh, 1 Samuel, but let me set this up. So, David, David is made famous by his battle with Goliath. Now, how many of y'all have already heard of David and Goliath? Just raise your hand. Okay, it's almost, almost everybody in the room. Okay, if you haven't, I'm sorry. I didn't want to point you out there, but, you know, David and Goliath. And so, he was a teenager when he fought Goliath. 
And we begin to see the troubles David was going to face from King Saul as we read this in 1 Samuel 18. So look, look at 18, verses 6 through 11. 1 Samuel 18, 6 through 11. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, that's, that's Goliath, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul. Now, Saul was king, the first king. And they were singing, with singing and dancing, with joyful songs, with timbrels, tambourines, or lyres, or guitars, or harps. As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. Now, I don't know what kind of song this is. I would imagine it have a, some distorted guitar, you know, sort of a rock kind of 80s rock, big hair, you know, kind of thing. Uh, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. Verse 8, Saul was very angry. This, this refrain or this chorus displeased him greatly. Quote, he quoted this, they have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. I mean, it's like, like a little kid, like a junior high kid. Sorry, junior high kids, but it's true. What more can we get, but what more can he get but the kingdom? I'll just give him the kingdom. And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David, right? Close eye on David. The next day, an evil spirit from God, we'll talk about this in a little bit, an evil spirit from God came forcefully on Saul. He was prophesying in his house while David was playing the lyre as he, was, as he usually did. Saul had a spear in his hand and he hurled it, saying to him, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. So David, not only was he kind of a warrior, big time warrior, but he was also a musician. He's like a man's man, a renaissance man. And so, but he would sort of calm Saul's heart because and his spirit because his, maybe he had some anger issues, you know, or, or, or something. But David would play and Saul's anger build up so much and his, his jealousy that he got a spear through it. And the and, and Bible even said he, he threw it twice. And some, some people believe it, it, it's in the same incidents or, and other biblical scholars say it happened in a different, uh, you know, occasion. But what we do know is this, is that David eluded him twice, and then he stopped coming around. I think that's a good sign, right? Like, if my father-in-law, John Vilar, was, threw a spear at me when I was courting his daughter, I think I would get the message, right? But good thing he didn't. He just fed me good crawfish and jambalaya. So, David, what, what we notice about David is, David didn't deny what was happening. He did not deny what was happening. He stopped showing up at the hurt party. He stopped showing up at this hurt party. When your heart is broken from the hurtful words or actions, don't hang around for continued beatings. When you have hurtful words or actions, by, especially for, for those who are close by, don't keep hanging around for that. As we make excuses and deny our reality, we get stuck in life. We can't move forward because it's too painful. We aren't really healed. We're not easily, we, we're not well during that season. We just kind of go in circle and it's, it's easier to just uh, stay stuck because moving forward might upset the apple cart. But again, we're dealing with people that we know Close people, close friends, family members even. We deny sometimes that there is even a problem or an issue. And so we push it in the back of the mind thinking, no, it's just a season. It'll just go away. And so we sort of deny it. We have the most difficulty acknowledging the hurt when it comes from those who are close to us. We typically hope it will just go away, but it rarely does. So we need to do what David does. Stop denying that there's a problem. Stop hiding it under the rug, hiding it behind the door. Don't deny that there's a problem because there is. And it's okay to talk to people about that. There is. Now, obviously, 
if there's a spear in their hand, you may not want to talk to them. It's probably why David didn't hang around. But David didn't kept, keep going back. Oh, I'm going di- to dodge this one and I'm going to dodge another one. No, he saw the writing on the wall. He's like, I'm out of here. So David did not deny As you may recall, David was anointed to be the next king after Saul when he was a young teenager. So we see this. We see the prophet Samuel anoint David. Now we're going to be in 1 Samuel, so go back a couple of chapters, chapter 16. 1 Samuel 16, verse 11. 11 through 13. So he, Samuel, asked Jesse. Jesse was the father of of David, and obviously David's brothers. He asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep, Samuel said. Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah, which is a a town. So the Lord told Samuel, now Saul is king. God didn't really want Saul's king, but the people demanded, we want a king. So God's like, all right, give him Saul. God wanted David. He, his plan was, hey, let's, David's coming up. Let's just wait for him to be the first king. But all right, Saul. And so, but God told Samuel, it's time to anoint the next king. So he went to Jesse's house. He had a lot of sons. Mm, none of these are it. I, I, I don't feel it. I'm not feeling the vibe. I'm not feeling the love. Do you have anybody else? Yeah. He's tending the sheep. And this, in this day, he could be like, he's upstairs cleaning the toilets. Yeah, bring the guy cleaning the toilet. Plunger and all. Bring him down here because I need to check out everybody. And obviously, he was the one. So we have this sort of anointing of David as the next king. So let's fast forward to after Saul was killed in battle and David was finally anointed king. It says this. Now, we're we're going to 2 Samuel. So we're going to go fast forward big time. 2 Samuel, chapter 5, verse 3 through 5. Verse 5, 3 through 5, and it says, When all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, The king made a covenant with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah for 33 years. 33 years he reigned over. It's interesting that that's the same amount of time that Jesus lived on this earth. So David was anointed king. There was a divided kingdom. You had Judah, and you had Israel in the northern kingdom. Judah is the southern kingdom. So uh, the capital of Judah was Hebron, and David ruled that. And then the Israelites, you know what? We, uh, we like what David's doing. Let's combine back together again as one united kingdom. And David ruled them for 33 years by the blessing of God. But what's really interesting about this, sort of these bookends of the anointed by Samuel and then them calling him their king. So biblical scholars say that David was no older than 15 years old when he was anointed by Samuel and oil was pulled over his head. He was 30 years old when he finally became king. That's a span of 15 years or maybe more. 15 years. What do we see from David? What do we see from David? Now, during that 15 years, understand this. Saul is chasing him. He's he's spreading false information, trying to kill him for all of those years. 
And during that time, what does David do? He showed great patience. He showed patience in the middle of the hurt. He did not announce to people that he should be made king. Hey, I'm anointed king. You know, put it on Instagram. Hey, look, Samuel, king, I've got oil. And, and look, I'm king. I'm the next king, right? You need to anoint me. No. He didn't, he didn't do that at all. He was patient through the hurt. He was also patient with the Lord to unfold his plan. Back at our previous point, we read that the next day an evil spirit from God came forcefully on Saul. Remember that? When I said I'll talk about that later. So an evil spirit from the Lord came upon Saul. It's obvious the Lord allowed the spirit to come to life and bring hurt to David. Now, why in the world would God do that? Why would God allow an, an, a spirit, an evil spirit, a hurtful spirit to come upon Saul so he could provide hurt to David? Why would God do that? I, I firmly believe it's to begin the process of removing Saul as king of Israel. It was the beginning process of removing Saul as king of Israel. Because remember, God's like, I, I really don't want that guy. I want this guy. So, all right, I'm going to send an evil spirit, and uh, some of his flaws are going to be are, are going to be expounded. I mean, they're going to be magnified, and people are going to really understand who this guy really is. And they did. God's plan was to bring his chosen king to the throne while running Saul out of the picture. In order to do that, he had to bring out the worst in Saul to expose who he was. But that meant that someone had to be the receiving end of Saul's unhealthy character. And who was that? That was David. David was on the receiving end. So the reason I'm hanging out here is because I think this is something that can speak to us. It spoke to me as I was preparing this message. It's been my experience that the Lord will allow certain things to happen in order to move people out where he is working or to move people closer to him. He would allow people to sort of freak out or allow certain things to happen so that he can move them out, so he can move forward. We see this in Saul. And then also, he uses that to bring people closer to him. Think about a wayward child. You may have, there may be people here or watching live or, or later that you, you've had a wayward child and, and they've done some things, even said hurtful things to you or done things to you and it's very hurtful and it caused heartache and a broken heart be, because they're close to you. And yet, in the middle of the hurt, what happens a lot of times, maybe not every time, they realize what they've done. And they become broken. And as I said earlier in my introduction, broken people have a greater need for God. And they cry out for God. They cry out for God. But as the parent, it's very hurtful. So parents... If you are in a situation, or those young couples, and you haven't had children yet, it's going to happen. If you have children that are just not doing well, I mean, doing some bad things is just going off the deep end, and, and you're, you're sort of the, the receiving end of, that, of those hurtful words or those actions, I just want to encourage you, hold on. Hold on, because that's actually God moving in their life. I know it's hard to see. It's actually God moving in their life, and God moving in your life and your family's life. So I just want you to encourage you to hold on. Be patient. Be patient. So David 
didn't deny what was happening. He showed patience. And then, let's move on. In the middle of your broken heart, I just want to encourage you. Don't deny. Make sure you show patience. But we see another way David responds to the heartache that was unleashed by King Saul. When Saul was chasing David, he had 3,000 men who were pursuing him. And in one particular instant, Saul decided to go inside of a large cave. And the Bible, I mean, no other way to put this. I mean, he went to the cave to use the bathroom, <laughs> right? And so he went to the restroom there in its cave, a really big cave. It was a, it was a deep cave. And so he, he just imagine he climbed up on, uh, on this ridge and he's in this cave and the men are down, uh, his men are down there, 3,000 men. And so King Saul is there by himself. But what he didn't realize is that David and his men, his men, were hiding deep in the same cave. David's men urged him to go kill Saul while he was preoccupied. That'd be an awful way to die, by the, by the way. If you're picturing that. With Saul's back to the cave, David approached him with a sword and cut off a piece of his robe. Just a corner piece of his robe. Saul didn't realize it. Must have been a pretty long robe. After Saul finished his business and was down the hill from the cave, David appears from the cave and has this conversation with him. We're in 1 Samuel. Go back to 1 Samuel. 24. 1 Samuel 24, verse 8. The David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, My Lord, the king. My Lord, the king. Hear that? I mean, Saul's chasing him with 3,000 men. My Lord, the king. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed and prostrated himself uh, with his face to the ground. He said to Saul, why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you? In other words, why do you believe the people that are saying that I want to kill you? I want to harm you. This day, you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay my hand on my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but did not kill you. See that there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I'm guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me. And may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me. But my hand will not touch you. Powerful scene. David could have had his guy. But he didn't. Why? Why? Because David showed respect. David showed respect. I mean, you, you saw those words. You, you read those words. He showed nothing but respect. He showed respect, not revenge. He showed respect, not revenge. When people, especially people who are close to you, friends, or you thought maybe they were your friends or your family members, and they say hurtful things to you or do hurtful things to you, the first thing we naturally want to do is we want to get back at them. We want to, we want to take revenge out on them. But David shows us, because David's going to be used by God, remember? 15 years later, I mean, he's an ordinary king. He's the greatest king that's ever lived. He's going to be used by God. Instead of Instead of revenge, he chooses respect. I know you're going to want to just get after people who have caused you hurt, who have caused that broken heart. But I want to encourage you, don't choose revenge. Choose respect. 
showing respect to someone who has caused hurt in your life is one of the most difficult things to do. I know this personally. I naturally want to have revenge, but God doesn't honor that. He honors respect. So David shows us, don't deny that the problem exists. Don't think the problem's just gonna go away. Show patience. Even though you're hurtful, God is doing something in this. Whatever it is, he, he is doing something. If, as you trust in him and as you pray and as you get on your knees during the season, I encourage you, if, during the season, be on your knees every day, literally on your knees, and say, Lord, help me through this. Help me be patient. Help me show respect to those people in my life, not revenge. And then the last, I think, is the most difficult. This is the last and fourth one. I think it's the most difficult. We see in the life of David the value of showing forgiveness. Forgiveness. You want to be used by God? (laughs) You got to forgive the people who cause you hurt. Now, that's all over the Bible. But if you want to be used by God, in the way that he really wants you to be used, then you need to forgive. You need to forgive. I want you to notice that what this point doesn't say. It doesn't say forgive and reconcile. I love to see that happen. It's great to reconcile. But trust in developing a relationship takes time. And sometimes reconciliation is impossible. But forgiveness isn't. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't forgive. If reconciliation can't happen between you and the other person, forgiveness can happen. We forgive in order to free ourselves. We forgive in order to free ourselves. When we forgive, we free ourselves from bitterness, anger, and from the desire to seek vengeance on the people who cause us the greatest hurt. That's what forgiveness does. It frees us from wanting to cause vengeance, from bitterness, from anger. Forgiveness is not putting yourself in a position to be hurt again. It is, it is not saying that what happened to you didn't matter or wasn't wrong. Forgiveness is simply releasing the pain and hurt and the situation into God's hand. David was estranged from Saul until Saul finally died. But I honestly believe in all those years When David was fleeing, he had dealt with his own self to the degree where he was free and offered forgiveness. He had forgiven Saul. He never reconciled with Saul because Saul died in battle. That never happened. But he, but David offered that forgiveness. We see signs. How do we know? We see signs of his forgiveness. In his long lament to Saul after his death. Now, this is just one verse in Samuel 1, 24. But it simply says, this is part of a song that David wrote. And it says, daughters of Israel, weep for Saul. Who clothed you in scarlet and finery. Who adorned your garments with ornaments of gold. In other words, he ruled well in a way that our economy did great things. You, you had more than you ever needed or desired. So daughters of Israel weep for Saul. That shows forgiveness. Another sign of David's forgiveness is when he showed kindness to the only remaining, remaining household of David. He found Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth, very hard word to say, Mephibosheth, who was one of Saul and Jonathan's relatives who was lame in his feet. And David brought him to his own house and had him sit around his table. If you remember correctly, a few months ago, uh, in the, the table series that, uh, that I share with you, we had a whole 
sermon on that. Beautiful story of forgiveness. You know what most kings did to former families? They get rid of them. David, David had every right to either exile him or kill him. Or, but no. David's like, no, no, no. You, you sit at my table. You sit at the king's table. The king's table. What a beautiful display of forgiveness. That's how we know that David forgave Saul. I think David forgave him a long time ago. So, in the middle of David's broken heart, and we know he had to have a broken heart. One thing I haven't even mentioned is Saul's son, Jonathan, who was supposed to be the next heir. David and Jonathan were very, very, very close. And because of the way Saul, his best friend's dad, was treating him, it just broke his heart. So in the middle of a broken heart, don't deny that it's, that it's happening. Show patience. Hang in there. God's behind it. Show respect to those people, and it's very difficult to do. I find it the best to pray for them. That helps you build that respect and then show forgiveness. David learned an important yet difficult lesson about brokenness. How do we know? There's one verse in Psalm 147. Just look at this real quick. Psalm 147, verse 3. Check out these words. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He heals the brokenhearted. God, God does. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. David learned his lesson. What a great lesson about who God was in that 15-year journey. No wonder David was man after God's own heart. As I close, I'm going to read part of Psalm 63, 1 through 8. Check out these words from David. Now, these words were written in the middle of all that junk. By the way, when you are in the middle of, of, of junk in your life, of, of, you know, being heartbroken, it's a great time to journal. It's a great time to just write out your feelings because some of the most important, deep parts of your spirit, of your soul, is revealed in that. And you'll go back and like, man, did I write that? Yes, you did. You and your spirit wrote that. But check out what David wrote <laughs> in the middle of that. Verses 1 through 8. Psalm 63. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. In the middle of this junk, in a dry and parched land where there is no water. He's describing what he's in. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Why? Because your love is better than life. Better than life itself. My lips will glorify you. Doesn't matter what's happening. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. You know, when we're in the middle of the junk and we lift up our hands, what is that? That's a sign of surrender. That is a sign of surrender. Lift up our hands. Verse 5, I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods, with singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night because you are my help. I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. What an amazing set of verses. What an amazing song. I can't wait in heaven to say, David, sing me the, 
the melodies for Psalm 63. Of course, he didn't call it Psalm 63. You know, we men kind of did that. But, but this song, just tell me, sing it for me. The melody has got to be amazing. When you are in that season, read stuff like this. Write stuff like this. And guess what? God's going to use you. You don't think you can be used because of your brokenness? Yes, you can. You can be used because of your brokenness. I feel led that we need to have just a time of prayer. And here's what I want us to do. We have elders here in our midst, and we have some, uh, some women, obviously my wife, and some other women who feel comfortable, you know, praying for people and stuff. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go to the piano, and I'm just going to let the Lord have his way. And what I want us to do is I want us to stand. I'm not going to sing. I'm just going to play. We're going to let the Lord sing over you. If you are in that season of brokenness and broken heart or know someone and you want to stand in the gap for them, come down to the altar and, and seek prayer and have people pray for you. Or you could just pray by yourself. It doesn't matter. But the altar is going to be open. And what I want us to do, it's in just a moment, we'll stand. I'm going to pray. We'll stand. I want our elders to come down. Any of the women that feel comfortable praying for others. And then let's just have a time where we just lay that down at the altar. Heavenly Father, we come before you thanking you for the awesome opportunity we can be held in your hand. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy. Help us, Lord, to get in touch with you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. To my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am made of I will sing of the goodness of God And to my life you have been To my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am made of, I will sing of the goodness of God.
You know, it's good for the Lord just to wash over the soul, right? Amen. Pray with one another. So I just want to encourage you. If you're ever in that season, some of you may be in that now. Some of you may have gone through that. Maybe that's in the future. Just, we can learn a lot from David. We can learn a lot from David. Um, And I just, I pray that the Lord has spoken to you. He's spoken to me, definitely. And I thank the Lord for that. And, uh, and we pray that God will just, God will bless you. Know that we're here for you as a church. We're your family. And there are more people out there who could be part of this family. So go find several people. Call them this week. Tell them to get here. All right? Hey, we get to take communion next week. I cannot wait. We close out this series. You don't want to miss it. Make sure you're here. We love you guys. And we'll see you later. Thank you.